Hey guys, welcome back to Matt Keeps Fish. Today we have a lot of interesting stuff to go through. I literally have three pages of notes full of interesting stuff to talk about regarding this tank and future plans and stuff like that. So let's jump right into it. They are in fact Danios. You can call them Galaxy Rasboras if you want, but scientifically they are Danios. Now, as you guys know, I quarantined them for a month. I quarantined all my fish for a month and I kind of slipped up on that for these guys. They look really healthy. I was trying them on a bunch of different foods. They were accepting everything. They were really active. They were showing good color. And I thought, why keep them in quarantine any longer? After all, issues of bacterial infection, fungal infection, things like that are often visible within the first week and internal parasites are visible after the first month. However, if they become skinny or start refusing food within those first two weeks, then they also likely have an internal parasite, even if the parasite itself is not visible. Because none of these symptoms were a factor, I put them right in the tank and they've been doing well ever since. For those of you interested in getting Celestial Pearl Danios or Galaxy Rasboras, there's been a little bit of tension on whether or not they will accept dry foods or if they need live foods, even so far as fresh baby brine shrimp every day, I'm here to confirm that they will indeed eat dry foods, or at least the batch that I've received. I'm sure if you got wild caught CPDs or galaxy rasboras, they would be a little bit more difficult to get onto dry foods, but that's why I say it's always better to get uh, captive bred species over wild caught species. Over the next little while, I'd spend a lot of time looking into the aquarium, trying to understand the hierarchies, making sure the aggression wasn't too bad between any two species or within a species. The honey gourami left everybody alone, although everybody clearly knew that he is the boss, and I have identified it to be a male. If you're ever wondering, the way that you identify whether a gourami is male or female, at least for honey gouramis, is you shine a flashlight through them, and since their bodies are semi-translucent, you will be able to look for ovaries or the lack thereof. The lack thereof meaning that it is a male. In terms of hierarchy, the runner-up to the honey gourami is the larger female ember tetra. She rules the bottom space and all the food therein is hers. While females seem to be dominant in my tank as far as tetras go, the males are definitely the dominant ones as far as danios go, though they are not dominant over the tetras. The males will some days chase the females around all day, spawning with them in the moss, and other days they will just school nicely with one another, including the females, or do some light sparring with the other males. I really do love the displays that the male danios have when they're sparring with one another, and even when they're not. The orange on their anal, ventral, and dorsal fins, even their tail fins, really pops against the starry knight-like body that they have. And it matches really well with the honey gourami's orange and the orange of the ember tetras, something that was an intentional feature as I chose this aquarium's inhabitants. Now as you look through this aquarium, even as you look behind me, you'll see that there's a lot more plants than there were last time. You can see here there's a radican sword, we've got a melon sword kind of struggling underneath it, the hair grass is a little bit hard to see behind the Cryptocorin Wendetta. The Suswasser Tang, although not as big as we want it to be by this time, is still growing. And on the left side of this beach aquarium, we also have an Amazon sword and some Jungle Valisneria. Plants that usually grow very quickly, although for some reason not in this case. And if you look under the driftwood on the left side, you can see the Java Fern leaves growing slightly and the moss balls with little to no growth at all. If we look at the vase in my bedroom, the pearl weed is actually flowering. This is the first time that I've ever had an aquatic plant flower for me, and although the flowers are very, very small, it makes me feel pretty accomplished. Well, now that we've talked about all the great things about the aquariums, let's talk about all the issues that came soon thereafter. You may recall that in the last video, I bought the honey gourami with three amber tetras and I had them in quarantine for a while. They were all doing really well, and then I put them in the 20 gallon, and I noticed that one of the amber tetras started to isolate itself. I thought it was no big issue. Most of the ember tetras will scatter and be on their own for an entire day. But even when all the other fish were schooling together, this one ember tetra decided to stay by the filter, breathing very heavily. 
the tetra had an oddly curved spine, possibly indicating scoliosis, and a stomach that never seemed to fill. It always seemed a little bit skinny. Worried that it was parasites or some internal bacterial infection I had missed, I moved it into the quarantine tank where it soon died thereafter. Although I was frustrated at the loss, the aquarium seemed healthy, and so I thought that it was just a random occurrence. Then my worst nemesis seemed to rear its ugly head. Floating within the biofilm on the surface of the water appeared these small tubules. And I suppose I could describe them as little pea pods that seemed to have little translucent peas within them. At first, I quickly assumed that it was just decay from the plants that floated to the surface, as I had added a few new plants. But then they didn't really seem to go away. They just kept appearing and appearing and appearing, and sometimes the surface would be filled with 20 or more of them. Confused, I kept a specimen of one in a cup, but nothing ever became of it. It never changed. As this was happening, I became worried that it could be the eggs of a parasite or leeches or something like that. But it couldn't be, right? because I had quarantined and everything was eating well. Or were they? To be honest, it had been a long time since I'd seen any of the fish defecate. Not that that's something that you look for, but with larger fish, it's very, very easy to know if the food is passing through them normally. With smaller fish, it could be easier to miss. But did I miss it that often? Finally, one day while I was at work, my wife sent me a picture of the honey gourami with translucent feces coming out of the bottom of the fish. As you may remember, this used to be a goldfish tank. Someone was selling it on Kijiji and sold it with four goldfish, three of which were feeder goldfish. And as someone who works at a pet store, I know that the feeder goldfish come in in pretty bad condition sometimes, being that they are bred for quantity and not for quality. Could a parasitic worm have dropped from the goldfish and burrowed its way into the sand, only to be reawoken when new hosts appeared on the scene? Immediately I started doing my research on internal parasites of all kinds. The previous one that I had dealt with that you can see here was Camelanus coti, or coti. I knew that if the tubules that I was seeing before were in fact egg cases, then it could not be this parasite, as this is a live-bearing worm. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't another worm, an egg-laying, Parasite. Knowing from my previous experiences how quickly an internal parasite can decimate an entire community, I acted quickly. And to my surprise, the medications I ordered showed up. Now, if you live in Canada, for the most part, medications like this, medications that cure parasites in fish, are illegal. And if you remember my last encounter with parasites, the medications I ordered had to be for cattle and not for fish. This led to the medication being very ineffective and likely the cause of the fish's death. This time, however, I had a medication that would not only cure the fish, but not pose a risk to them or any of the invertebrates or plants. Believing that the honey gourami was the main host of these parasites, I immediately moved it into the five gallon quarantine aquarium, gave it salt to boost the metabolism, which would be able to fight off any secondary infections these parasites might cause, and, as I said, order the medication with hopes that it would arrive. Thankfully, the medications showed up this time, and as they did, I found that the gourami started having normal feces clearly visible on the bare bottom tank. Rather than translucent and empty feces, I instead found colored, and nutrient-rich feces, nutrients that the parasites would have otherwise eaten if they existed in the first place. I returned to do further research. What was going on with my honey gourami? As it so happens, empty feces may also occur if the fish has not eaten very much. If there are no solid foods being processed by the fish, then all that will come out are empty or liquid feces. And so it may have been the higher fiber combined with the salt while in quarantine that allowed me to see my fish's regular feces. Then what were those little tubules on the surface of the water that were occurring so often for such a long time? My theory is that they were actually the result of plant decomposition, likely from the stem plants we had in before, or from the roots of other plants that had rotted off. But, honestly, it still could have been a parasite. The tubules still could have been from the eggs of tapeworms. And the healthy feces that we were seeing before may only be the calm before the storm, and only time will tell. But the hits just keep on coming, don't they? Because while I did get some free water lettuce from one of my good friends at the store, I was fortunate enough to have some downtime to carefully look through them before putting them in my tank. And guess what I found? Not just snail eggs, but at least two different species of leeches. 
Now these aren't the big dark leeches that latch onto your arm and look like Squidward's nose. These are teeny tiny leeches that like to prey on things like shrimp or my assassin snail. If you don't want certain things in your aquarium, you need to make sure that you look through all of the things you are putting in your aquarium. To look forward to a little farther in the future is Hope's redo of the five gallon quarantine tank. She's going to do killifish or a betta or something like that with it. Just look forward to that. I'm not going to have a hand in it at all. It's all going to be her unless she needs some advice. And uh, yeah, so that's all the updates. That's been the last month and a half or more than that, I, I think. So if you guys want to see more updates like this, subscribe to the channel. If you like the video, give it a like and I'll see you guys on a Sunday. Thank you.